The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. My name is Jasmine, and I am a recovering drug addict. My name is Richie Farrell, AKA the old white junkie. And we are your hosts for Exit Team Nashua. Our mission is to bring recovery into the living room. Last year, over 72,000 Americans died of an accidental overdose. That's almost 200 Americans every single day. We will bring you guests with real life experiences with addiction and recovery. Welcome, welcome to, to Exit, Exit Team, Team Nashua. Nashua. Hi, welcome to Exit Team Nashua. My name is Jasmine and I am your host. As always, uh, I'm honored to be here sharing time with you and thank you for tuning in and for all the love and support that you guys continue to give us. Um, you know, I think every week we're really excited for the show that we're going to bring you. Uh, but this week I'm, I'm definitely pretty excited because you meet people on your journey and people come into your life for a reason always. And when I met today's guest, she walked into the room and she was just so bright. She literally was like a big ball of sunshine and she had this big smile on her face. And I was like, yes, uh, <laughs> I see you. Uh, and it's been like that ever since knowing her, you know, I mean, obviously like we all have off days, but overall, um, Danielle has been someone who has, for lack of a better term, prov provided warmth for me, yeah. you know, um, just like being around her is very comforting. Um, and she's... Uh, a genuine soul, and uh, I'm really excited to have you on the show. <laughs> Thank you. So, Danielle, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, for all of our viewers at home, um, what brought you here? Why are you here? Why am I here? Um, well, I'm here because I wanted a chance to be of service and share my story in hopes that it'll inspire or help someone else. Your story, like your story pertaining to what? Because we all have stories, right? Yeah, and you know, I guess I have like a few stories too. You know, <laughs> like, a few like, things we could talk about. <laughs> but um, today, this is substance use disorder, right? So we'll, we'll stay to that one. <laughs> cool. We'll leave the other personalities out of it today. <laughs> uh, substance use disorder. Yes. So, um, okay, cool. So mm. I met you working in the field of substance use disorder. Um, yeah. You know, addiction, alcoholism. We get so proper. When I first started the show, I'd be like, yeah, I fucking junk you. I just swore. Whoops. Oh. <laughs> and, and I've grown so much over the years. I'm like, yes, you know, substance use disorder. Yeah. <laughs> I like, feel so sophisticated when I say that. Um, all right, cool. So I met you working in the field. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, you didn't just, like, wake up one day and be like, oh, like, I'm going to work in the field of alcohol and addiction. Like, you had your own personal experience with that. Yes. So when, like, how old were you when you first started using? Um... When I first started using, I started drinking probably, I would say, like, steadily at, like, 14. Okay. I probably had used prior to, but I wasn't, like, actively drinking until 14. Would you say that, like, the first substance that you ever picked up was alcohol? Yeah. Was that because, like, alcohol is, like, socially acceptable and in many homes readily available? or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So you picked up um, probably a little bit before 14, but you started drinking regularly at 14? Yeah. I wasn't probably not daily, but definitely like that's when like the, the partying on the weekends and things like that started happening. And I would say that that's probably when I first started to drink also 14, 15, when I started to drink, um, you know, to not have to deal with my emotions. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't like how you were feeling. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know what's crazy? So um, today I'm a much, you know, clearly I'm a much different person than I used to be. <laughs> I'm not a robin anymore. Hey. <laughs> Society's a little bit safer. Um, but no, today I was, uh, you know, I was hiking with my dog, which is like literally one of my favorite things to do. I, I got a dog specifically because I love being outside and I wanted a dog. I wanted that yeah. companion to be there with me. And um. You know, I was like walking and I was like thinking about work and thinking about everything we do and like thinking about like how I can make a difference. And, you know, because I've been through this journey, you know, and I've been through mm. similar experiences as people at work. And I was like reflecting on and I was thinking about like when I was in treatment and like 
I have been running from myself for so long. Like I, I think about like now how I can sit and like have actual thought processes. And like, I have just been such a doer. Like I've been running for so long that I never even allowed myself to sit with emotion. And so I think about, you know, I was thinking about like some of the things that we tell clients to do. And I was like, I would have never been able to do that. Yeah. Because I didn't even know what I was running from. I didn't even know that that was emotion because I would never allow myself to just be long enough to sit with the emotion, you know, and I started um, my journey started my first drink at the age of nine, alcoholically mm. drinking by the age of 12. But if you asked mm. me when I was 12 years old, like if I didn't like how I was feeling, I, I wouldn't even be able to tell you that. Yeah. You know, because I was and, and I come from a, a long history of trauma and abuse, too. Yeah. So, you know, they they say that, uh, you know, trauma impacts the brain to the prefrontal cortex, like the same way addiction does. So I've really been running for a really, really, really long time. Yeah. And it was crazy to sit back today and think like, because I was trying to think of how I can be more useful and, and be of more service at, at my job. And I was like, Dude, I would have never even been able to understand what, what people were telling me. They're actually doing a really good job. Yeah. Um, okay. So you were running from how you were feeling. Did you, ha- I went on that rant because I wanted to know, did you have the awareness when you were 14 that like, hey, I don't like how I'm feeling? Yeah. No, I did not have that okay. awareness. And I think like, no, I like that you brought that up because I feel like for one, that's a huge part of it is like, you know, they talk a lot of different programs talk about like having that um, spiritual awakening. And to me, part of that spiritual awakening is just developing those new changes of like perceptions where you are now self-aware and you are able to even recognize that, you know, so it's like before that you don't, yeah, it's like I had no idea. And even still though, honestly, you know, like for me, I'm, you know, like I like to make it clear um, when I do talk about it is like, I still struggle you know what I mean like life is so much better and it's beautiful but like it's still life and like I still in trauma too yep. and you know so I still have that stuff and it's like I have to remind myself still like to let myself feel because there's other ways for me to still you know not feel my emotions other than to turn to substances whether that's just like distracting myself with like external things or you know like in my in the past it's been like dating or relationships or um, food or you know things like that So like still, you know, I got to, I have those tools now, luckily, where I'm like, oh, okay, something's not right. And I can like recognize it and like let myself feel it. And two, like, I feel like even after I got sober, I had a lot of anxiety and I had, which obviously came hand in hand with like the trauma aspect of it. But also I realized that I still wasn't letting myself feel emotions And I was so, like, I thought, like, being mad or sad was so bad, and I didn't want to show anyone that, like, anything other than a positive emotion. And I had to learn, like, that, like, we can only stuff things down for so long, and they're going to come out in other ways. (laughs) (laughs) Some days you just really got to (laughs) cry. Yeah. But that's a good, I mean, like, mine were, like, panic attacks. And I was like, this is, like, not okay. (laughs) So now, like, still, yeah, like, I have to be, like, remind myself like you gotta like sit with it and And how do you do that like how do you even identify like oh like I don't like that or oh this is okay or oh that makes me sad like what 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 helped you do that for people that are struggling with that themselves I think it's I don't know it's kind of hard to like pinpoint one thing but I know like now I'm just incredibly sensitive to like um you know not only like my feelings but other people's feelings and like energy and things around me yeah so Mm -hmm. like I'm like too oh it's like a pain you know I'm like too sensitive to it but so I know immediately like once I feel off and I just have to kind of figure it out and I don't always know you know right away at least and I do have to um think and I think that's where a lot of like this my spiritual tools I guess you could call it come into place and like um like meditation um journaling things like that but um I guess that would be you know for me probably a praying to you know just Mm -hmm. whatever it is that kind of connects me to my higher power because I kind of utilize that as guidance okay yeah so you were 14 um and you know you started drinking quite frequently and so I mean what like what transpired in your life for your addiction to progress because like it didn't end alcoholically right like I mean it it, (laughs) it ended with you abusing substances alcoholically but it wasn't alcohol yeah okay so um Started with alcohol, um, and that was definitely, like, you know, I, I definitely abused alcohol. I got a DUI at the age of 16, um, 
I almost, I was like inches away from crashing my I'm car. I'm sorry, I just, <laughs> I just tried to picture you 16 and drunk. I made you wrong too. Oh God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, and it was, it's kind of actually ironic because I saw, I got a DUI, right? And I was inches away from crashing my car and I was like, but when I got arrested for this, the cop is like, you know, your name sounds really familiar. And I'm just like wasted. And I'm like, that's because my family member's a lawyer, da 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 da. Like, I'm gonna sue you. And like, he's definitely no one in my family is a lawyer. <laughs> and then we get to the police station and he's like, you know why your name sounds familiar? It's like, I got your family member for a DUI too. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and he's like, it's not a lawyer. <laughs> that's really good that you made him. He was like some big wig lawyer. <laughs> that's so good. I know. <laughs> I know. It's like, in this, what are the odds? The same cop, too. The same mm -hmm. exact cop. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> so I know there. But um, so, yeah, I like started that way. And then I don't know. Like, I honestly, I kind of was always attracted to. I don't want to say like the troublemakers like I was always attracted to that lifestyle and those people and I kind of always just felt like a misfit um and so that's what I like to be around and I ended up you know just partying and it started with pills and I got physically addicted and it ended like Percocet pills yes. or like Xanax pills Percocets yeah okay like painkillers okay yeah mm -hmm. and so and then obviously I got physically addicted and then it and like I inevitably ended up using heroin and like using IV and stuff like that. Where are um, you from? I'm from Derry. Okay, so you're from New Hampshire. Yeah. All right, so you ended up becoming an IV heroin addict. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, were you still located in like Derry, New Hampshire in that area? Yes. How old were you? When I, I was probably 18. 18 when you started using intravenously? Intravenously probably. Probably like 20. Okay. It's so crazy because um, I, I partied for such a long time. Yeah. And I didn't get sober until I was 32. And, uh, you know, you, <clears throat> you working in uh, substance use disorder, you are exposed to so many different things. And it's so crazy when I see my perception of a child like 18 years old coming in. They're using intravenously 20 years old. I'm like, oh, you're so little. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy because I was so reckless at that age as well. And I forget that now that I'm getting more mature. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So 20 years old, you're living in Derry, New Hampshire, uh, using intravenously. And, and so what happens in your life to like make you at least, did, it, did you get like sober right away? Did you try to get sober f for a while? Like what happened? So, no, I tried to get sober. Um, the first time I tried to get sober, I went, oh, I went to California. I went to rehab. Um, and what part of California? Like right outside of Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. And it pretty much like what got me there? I mean, I at this point, I was like, you know, I was homeless. I was just living with like drug dealers, like guys. So I had somewhere to live and it was just a really degrading lifestyle. And I don't, I remember like the day, like the very first time, but I don't really remember like what, I don't think anything like significant happened I just like I think someone asked me like a family member like do you want to get help and I'm like you know what like this is like yes like this is a pathetic lifestyle and it was but you know even at that point it wasn't nearly my worst <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> it was pathetic that it got a lot worse yeah. <laughs> so I went out to California <laughs> and I got sober for like I don't know four months maybe I I stayed sober which is actually pretty pretty good for your first child I think but um I ended up relapsing and going out and, um, you know, I was in a hotel room with like four other people and um, we were all using and I ended up overdosing and I like, they gave me um, CPR and I came out of it and I didn't use it again, but I overdosed again. And um, I was like so scared. That was my first overdose ever too. And I ended up going to the hospital, like overdosing one other time. And um, it was just, it was really traumatic in the hospital. Like I definitely wasn't um, treated with dignity in there. Um, this was probably back in 2000. And you're like outside of LA. Yeah. So they probably see a lot. They, yeah. They, yeah. I imagine that like emergency personnel is desensitized. Yeah. Okay. Really bad. And mm -hmm. this was back in like 2014, probably. So yeah. 
So yeah, it just wasn't, I had, you know, it was, a, that alone was like pretty traumatic because I, you know, they run like the, nar, the Narcane through you and you puke and you puke and you puke. And I like literally was like, please stop. I don't want to keep puking anymore. Cause like after you puke, like, a, you know, it's like so uncomfortable. And they're just like, oh, like well, you wanted to use like just really. And I was like alone. Cause I, you know, I didn't have family out there. And it was really, it was really scary. So I, after that, like I say, you'd think like I'd say sober, but I still didn't, you know? Yeah. They say fear, fear won't keep you sober. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was the first time. And then I went back and I went back to like my old like relationship really like toxic like it's like out in california like no you, i came back here you came back here yeah. to new hampshire yeah um and so you just like went back to the same people places things yep. okay yeah um and so you continued to do the same things yeah okay <laughs> I did. what happened it got much worse okay. um i ended up i thought that um a child would keep me sober and i got pregnant with uh, my boyfriend at the time and we had a very like toxic abusive relationship and um I got pregnant and after like at almost three months um you know there was just like this significant incident where like I was trying to stop using and I couldn't stop using and I went to um someone's house and ended up getting loaded and when I told my partner at the time he just completely like lost it and he you know, was like really physical with me. And I remember like I was trying to like crawl down the hallway and he's like grabs me by my leg and like rips me. When you told him you were, did you tell him you had relapsed yes. or to, that you had were pregnant? Okay. So relapsed. he knew you, he knew yes. you were pregnant. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, um, and he ended up choking me until I was unconscious. And like when I came to, I didn't even know what was going on at first. And it was like my pants were down at my ankles and I didn't know why. Um, could have been cause he was pulling me by the leg, which is what I'm assuming. But, um, I was just like, you know, I was, it was like really traumatizing that I'm like, dude, I can't bring a kid into this situation, you mm -hmm. know? And not only like, could I not stay sober, but I was in this like abusive, like toxic situation and it was really, really hard. Um, but I had to like make a decision that I thought was best for like me and the, you know, the child at the time. And yeah. So that actually was when I think like that was my point where I started using intravenously. Like that's when I really stopped caring. Like, you know what Probably I mean? Probably like the trauma from that alone, especially like as a woman instinct being put in that situation. I'm like, what do I do? Like, and you know, and for the best interest of the greater good, it's better to not bring this child yeah. into this world. Like what kind of life is it going to have? But at the same time, like that's traumatizing for us. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And I couldn't, I was, you know, I, was, I lived with him and I didn't have, I mean, I never worked. Like I didn't have anywhere else to go. And it was just like, I was trapped completely. And at that point, like, I don't know if you remember, but like, it's like, it's almost like throughout the beginning, like you still hold on to some sort of like morals and some sort of like hope. And then like, I don't know, for me, at least it was just like, that was the moment where like, it was all gone. And like, I was like off the rails, like didn't, even care because I didn't care about my life at all. I didn't care what was going to happen, you know. What happened to make you want to care again? Um, well, so I, I ended up, um, basically I lost, I was on like one of my parents' insurance, which is when I got to go to California. Um, and then You're that was, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you said you went to California, I already know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then I was off of it. So I didn't have insurance for a while. So I didn't like have a choice to go. And I didn't know, like, I don't think, I don't think that they had like the resources that we do now. Here they back don't. Then. When I, yeah, yeah. Back when like I got sober, you had to get on like waiting list and call in yeah. three times a day. And like, you'd have to be on these waiting lists forever. Like now, now, you know, the, the, the government has just put in so much work on New Hampshire. You, you can, without insurance, you know, you can get New Hampshire Medicaid and, and go to mm -hmm. treatment, you know, in multiple facilities. It's, you don't yeah. really have to wait like we did. Back yeah, in the day. exactly. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know like I just knew of that one place and I didn't know of like other twelve step options or anything like that at that time. And so part of it was like that, but I obviously like really wasn't ready either because I wasn't really looking into anything. But um the last like pusher for me to go end up in treatment was I um oh, so I had a childhood friend and that I grew up with and um 
he was very good friends with um, the person that I was dating and living with <laughs> at that time, <laughs> dating. And um, they like he would always come over and we'd all like hang out and like get loaded together. And um, he ended up going to rehab. And I remember like my boyfriend was like, hey, he needs a ride. He got kicked out for hooking up with a girl. He didn't like relapse or anything, but he needs a ride. Like no one will get him. We have to go get him. And I'm like, no, that's a horrible idea because we're using, you know what I mean? And he's like, well, he needs a ride. He's like, we're going to bring him to his mom's house. Like da, da, da. And I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. So I go there and um, he's like, yeah, you know, my mom won't let me go home. She says I have to go to a homeless shelter. And so at that time, I obviously was not educated on addiction whatsoever. And so I like to me, when I thought about that, I'm like, dude, I can't bring drop him off at a homeless shelter. Like that's like abandoning him. Like I felt like that was just like a horrible thing to do to someone. And I'm like, which obviously <laughs> I that would have been the absolute right decision to make. And I wish that I knew that back then, but I didn't. And so I was like, whatever, like he can come back with us. And he inevitably like got loaded and he ended up overdosing like a few weeks later and he didn't make it and like I had a lot a lot of guilt mm. about that and um yeah I was really just I was in a really bad depression I remember for like weeks and just like isolating and like then it just so happened that like I got my insurance back too and I was just like I had a dream too and he like came to me in a dream and I just knew like I had to go. Wow. Yeah, it was really crazy. That's um, you know, that's super unfortunate what happened, but yeah. like that's also the reality of this thing. And when you said that, like all my hair stood up. Like the reality of this thing is that people are dying every yeah. single day at an at an alarming rate. And um when you had said like, oh, like the best thing to do would have probably been to bring yeah. him to the shelter. And you know, there are probably a lot of people watching the show that were like, Oh God, no, that was but like no, like the truth is is yeah. like if we enable this disease, like we are we are coddling it and we are helping like those poor decisions is bringing if you brought him to the shelter, would it have changed the outcome? Who knows, mm -hmm. right? But at least you would have known that you didn't enable that decision making. Yeah, exactly. You know, for your own peace. Exactly. You know that, and that's the reality of this thing. Like, I cannot stress it enough. Like, we are up against like a life-threatening, fatal disease yeah. where we're put in situations sometimes where we have to do really uncomfortable things for our own peace of mind yeah. for the for the addict. You know. Yeah, and that boyfriend in mm -hmm. the story, he's overdosed and passed away too. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we're almost out of time, and your life's like pretty freaking good you yeah. know I, I i love like being a part of your journey and like seeing where your life's at now so so you went to treatment you got sober mm -hmm. um and, and what happened um i really started i oh my gosh i was like when i first got sober i was so like motivated i was like oh my gosh like i was like on fire <laughs> but i was like i'm gonna go to school for addiction and i want to help all these people and like all this stuff so like i started doing that i started going to school I started like interning at the treatment center that I worked at and um, it was really, really good. And I managed to, I managed um, two years of sobriety and I did end up relapsing on alcohol. Yep. Um, and it's weird to say, um, like to think about, but I definitely like, I definitely learned a lot and I got like that psychic change that I needed to remain sober for those two years, but I really didn't have like a full complete spiritual awakening in the sense where like I have now and I still very much lived in my ego. So that relapse on alcohol was like something that you needed to yes. deepen yourself and go internally. Yes, okay. absolutely. And like things since that last relapse, like that's actually really when like my spiritual journey has like taken off. And it's like, it's kind of weird to like, I don't know, to think about but and obviously like there was a lot of things that led up to that relapse as well um I I got assaulted in recovery and that really I was like dude this is why I got sober so I don't have to deal with things like this and that really was hard for me and it was hard for me to cope with and I ended up like um getting like a trauma response like eating disorder and I was like not eating and I had to go to treatment for that um before I ended up like relapsing on on substances well on alcohol but you know, I just still didn't really know how to manage my emotions still. It was like a journey to learn that. So I was trying in all these other ways to like cope and I like still didn't really know how to. And it was just like a matter of time before like, you know, that happened. Yeah.
Yeah, and what we really have to do with emotion is sit with them. Yeah. <laughs> and feel them. Yeah. <laughs> it's so gross. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, cool. So um, what's life like today? What's today, December 30th? Yeah. What's life like today, December 30th, 2020 for you? I'm pregnant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm pregnant. We're having um, a baby boy. Yes. His name's going to be Cash. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I'm like, that's crazy because um, I told you, one of my pregnancy stories, I also had another one at like a very, very young age too. That was another like traumatic situation. But so this time around, it was so crazy to be like, wow, like I'm actually in like a perfect situation. Like I'm in a healthy relationship. I'm engaged, like stable, like financially, I have a career. Um, you know, like I had already stopped smoking cigarettes and doing like everything unhealthy for me prior to. So when my, when I got pregnant, like I didn't have to change anything or stop anything. And I was just like, wow, <laughs> like I'm actually like doing something the right way, <laughs> you know, and I feel so ready to because I, you know, I don't know, I'm pretty like, no, 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 I'm just like matured now, you know, like not only like through like recovery and stuff like that, but just like as an adult, like I'm a lot more, I'm, you know, I'm 12 and I'm 27. So like, I just feel old soul too. So I just feel, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just feel like I'm just so ready for that stage of my life, you know. And so you're engaged. Yeah. That's amazing with yeah. a with a wonderful, healthy man and a healthy relationship yeah. and a, a gentleman that works on himself as well to, yeah. to grow. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, you have a stable place to live. Yeah. <laughs> you just adopted a kitty. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm a cat mom. <laughs> yeah, you're a cat mom. Um, you've, got, you've got your career and you're going to school. And yeah. So. That's really cool because like a couple of years ago, you were like homeless in an abusive relationship and had no hope yeah yeah it's like complete 180 it's really powerful <laughs> it's very powerful yeah. um so to anyone watching that's like struggling they don't think that they can do this they're not sure they want to do it they don't think they're worth it like what do you have to say to them um i mean honestly and this is probably something that could go for really anyone in any like stage of their journey but like just to remember that life is so fluid in the sense where like, you know, one moment you can feel like you're just, you can't do it. And like, you're so weak and you literally like, you know, have to use, or you have to, you know, whatever you're, you're going through. Um, and like, dude, if you could just sit on your hands, like you could feel so completely different in even 10 minutes. Yeah. Like all feelings pass. It's inevitable, you know? So just for anything, I mean, especially someone in that situation, but even like that's something that I try to remember today with other things that I struggle with is just not to give up because like things are always changing. Life's always changing. We're always growing. Yeah. And you just got to like hold on to like what you know is right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. It was great. Um, thank you to everyone watching. Um, so if you have not done so already, please hop over to our Facebook page. I am a heroin addict. Yes. Facebook pages, <laughs> I am a heroin addict because I am, and give it a little like. Thank you. seating program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.